All right, welcome back. <laughs> so this is video three of the series. And uh, we've learned the basics of flow. We've looked at lab workflow. Now we enter the meat of the matter in the next two videos. The first is we're going to uh, go over the concepts of how do we come to a diagnosis of a hematolymphoid neoplasm, like a leukemia or a lymphoma or a myeloma. What is the general gist or approach that one can use to conclude that there is a tumor in the specimen that came in for flow cytometry? And when we evaluate any population, we know its characteristics, and now we're gonna ask three relatively simple questions. So in every case, you would ask, what is the lineage of this population? And not necessarily in this order. You would ask, is it mature or immature? So are these cells uh, blasts or are they mature type of cells? And is this population normal? So expected phenotype? Or is it aberrant in some way, indicating this might be a neoplasm? And here you have to be really careful because these cells, all these immune cells, innate immune and adaptive immune cells, are constantly responding to external stimuli and they can show changes of reactive proliferation or reactivation changes. And you have to be very familiar with what happens during reactive processes to these phenotypes to determine what is aberrant. And that's when it can get tricky. But otherwise, you're just asking these three questions. And if you can have a lineage and prove it is aberrant, and maybe it's immature, then you'll have a diagnosis. If it's mature, you'll have a different diagnosis. So as simple as that. So for very simple guidelines, in terms of all these markers that we have to remember, uh, I would say uh, one easy way to remember is this way. Markers of immaturity. If you remember that CD34 and TDT, if a population is positive for CD34, and or TDT, you can be sure that it is an immature cell population. And if it's a tumor, then you're gonna to have to have terms like acute or blast in your diagnosis. Now the converse is not true. So uh, there can be a lot of immature populations, tumor uh, uh, cells that may not express CD34 or TDT. So it is helpful when expressed, but uh, you cannot conclude that just because it's not there, then it's a mature process. Lineage markers, the T lineage markers tend to be single digits, uh, you know, three, four, five are T cell specific. Two, seven, eight are also expressed by NK cells, uh, somewhat easy to remember. B lineage markers tend to be a little heavier numbers, 19, 20, 22, 79A. <laughs> And then uh, myeloid lineage, uh, if you have CD13, 33, myeloperoxidase, these are sort of run-of-the-mill myeloid markers. A combination of 36 and 64 together, or expression of CD14 or even CD4 can be thought of as monocytic differentiation markers. Uh, CD71 is the transferrin receptor uh, expressed by lots of cell types, but particularly bright in uh, red cell lineage, uh, which also expresses glycophorin A, so erythroid type markers. CD41 and CD61 are your GP2B3A, uh, platelet or megakaryocytic markers. And plasma cells uh, can be found in a specimen by their very, very bright expression of CD38, brighter than other cells, or their expression of CD138. So these are very simple guidelines. It's more complicated than that in some cases, but something to remember. So how do we go about proving that something is a neoplastic process? So what you wanna see is a proof of clonal proliferation and the way it is expressed in a flow cytometric study is by the detection of immunophenotypic aberrancy. You'll hear that term thrown around a lot. So when, when we were enumerating a long time ago what these populations do, what do tumors do? They sort of do five different things. And you don't need to read right now. We're gonna go uh, through examples of each on the subsequent slides. 
And in most cases, they actually do a combination of these features, either two or three or all five of these can be seen in a case. So let's see what, what tumors do. In the case of mature B cells, it's relatively easy. Okay, because we have this phenomenon of immunoglobulin light chain restriction. So on the left here, you're seeing polyclonal B cells where you have some cells green that are kappa and the other cells that are blue here that are lambda. So normal or reactive B lymphocytes show a kappa to lambda ratio of between one to two to one. If it is 0.9 or if it is 2.1, that may be okay, but it is one should look at it really carefully and rule out whether there's some hidden population. Uh, I feel comfortable when the ratio is between one to two to one. But B lineage neoplasia, obviously they show light chain restriction. Usually kappa lambda is read uh, off based on the diagonal. So anything to this side of the diagonal is kappa, to this side of that diagonal is lambda. And you can see this population, it's a CLL that is kappa light chain restricted. In addition, and you can see the polytopic B cells here splitting into kappa lambda, these blue dots. In addition to being on the kappa side, it's also clearly dim, so it's dropping antigen. So there's always a combination of aberrancies. The second thing tumors do is that they expand. So just finding too much of a particular type of population may be an indication that something neoplastic is going on. And a classic example of that is if you find CD34 positive cells, Usually you'll see them between one, one and a half percent at the most, even two to three percent is getting too much by flow. So let's say about a percent of, uh, of CD34 positive cells may be okay. But here's an example where almost 50 to 60 percent of the cells are CD34 positive and they have this great variability, which is an additional feature. You can be sure there is some kind of acute leukemia going on in this marrow specimen, right? So that is an indication there's too much of 34 positive cells in the marrow and it must be neoplastic. Now, the third thing that you will find in some tumors is that tumors co-express antigens of different lineages. Here's an example, a CD34 positive blast population that is positive for 19, similar to these B cells, but the same population in the same case is also positive for CD13, which I just told you is a myeloid marker, and also positive for CD33, which I told you is a myeloid marker. So we can be sure that there's a neoplastic process going on here because of co-expression of different lineage antigens. It could be an ALL, like a B cell lymphoblastic uh, lymphoma leukemia that happens to express myeloid markers apparently, or it could be an acute myeloid leukemia that happens to express CD19 apparently, and uh, we'll have to look at the entire case to know uh, which one it is. But what you can be sure is that there is a tumor that you need to pay attention to. The fourth thing that happens in tumors is they express their markers dyssynchronously. So this is one of my favorite populations in all of flow, the hematogons, little baby B cells going to marrow school. And you can see that uh, CD34 is a marker of immaturity. So there's a small subset of hematogons that express CD34, then they abruptly drop it, and eventually they will gain CD20 as a marker of mature B cells. So 34 is dropped before 20 is gained. That's proper uh, synchronization. But in, in this case, look at this subset of this red population is expressing both 34 and 20 in a significant way. And that is called dyssynchronous expression. This is a case of BALL that happens to be showing very nice dyssynchronous expression, not following the normal maturation pattern. So that's the fourth thing. And the fifth thing tumors do, which, uh, which is usually the hardest to know or to differentiate from reactive things that, tumor, that normal populations could do, is that they just show a lack or a higher expression of normally expressed antigens. So here is a T cell population that has dropped CD3. Here is a T cell population that instead of being single CD4 positive as a significant subset that is double negative, probably has dropped CD4 or hasn't gained it. You don't know which one, but tumors do really funny things. 
on uh, dropping of antigens, or in some cases, they can be too bright for certain antigens, like CD10 and ALL, for example. So that's sort of what they do. And the, the, this one uh, needs uh, intimate knowledge of a particular lab staining patterns, what fluorochromes you're using, and that way you can really determine something is brighter than usual or dimmer than usual. So, and again, usually tumors are going to do a combination of these five things. Okay. So once you have determined uh, that a tumor exists, then you can go down certain algorithms. And unfortunately, what I've seen uh, is that there are a lot of wrong algorithms floating around the internet. <laughs> and so now I'm going to contribute my own to this, uh, to cyberspace. And this one is a relatively easy one to remember. So once you reach a diagnosis of a mature B cell tumor, oops, a mature B cell tumor <clears throat> that has a small cell size, so let's say you see kappa or lambda like chain restriction, it's all B lineage markers and they're small in size. The next two markers you look at are CD5 and CD10. And practically speaking, you have three possibilities. Either you're single positive for CD5 or you're single positive for CD10 or you're negative for both. Double positive uh, is a possibility. I've seen three cases and so practically speaking, you hardly see it. And if you do, maybe you shouldn't believe it easily. So now if you're single positive for CD5 as a B cell tumor, then you have two possibilities. Either you're a CLL, SLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma, or you are a mantle cell lymphoma. There is a theoretical possibility that you could be a lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma as well. Keep that at the back of your mind. But these are the two sort of major possibilities. And so once you're in this, this uh, stage of the algorithm, you then look at CD23 versus FMC7. If you're CD23 positive and FMC7 negative, you're a CLL, SLL. If you're the other way around, then you're highly suggestive of a mantle cell lymphoma. If you're somewhere in between, definitely rule out mantle cell lymphoma. The, this side of the algorithm, you could be CD5 and CD10 negative then you are either a marginal zone lymphoma, a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, or a hairy cell leukemia. And we have specific markers to rule in hairy cell leukemia, right? And then the third possibility is that you're CD10 positive. Then if you're really small cell size, then essentially you have a diagnosis, you're a follicular lymphoma. If you have larger cells, then entertain Burkitt lymphoma, and of course, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, as you can see, can do whatever the hell it wants to do, any, any phenotype. Um, and we use these markers in a algorithm to determine what type of DLBCL it is. But the reason I'm putting larger cells, despite starting with small cell size here, I still wanted to put the larger cells in there uh, so that you know where they could fall. Uh, this is not any small cell version of large cell lymphoma, anything like that. It's just an additional italicized feature of the algorithm. That's about it. So that's where we'll, we will leave this section of our video series. And the next one is going to be really exciting where we will go into some live cases. And hopefully I can convince you of the beauty of cluster analysis.